Okay, continue with the session in the afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Nicolas Shia, who is an associate professor at the Mayo Clinic in the Department of Surgery and Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. He's director of the Beyond DNA Multiomics Program and co-associate director of the Microbiome Center for Individualized Medicine. Uh, Professor Nicolas Chia, his PhD in physics from the Ohio State University. His research focuses on uncovering mechanisms that give rise to population dynamics. The collective mechanism can lead to functional change in complex natural system, ranging from microbial community susceptibility to the emergence of cancer. His focus is on developing models to better understand microbiome interaction with the host environment and within the microbial community using artificial intelligence and its interface with mechanistic modeling techniques for complex biological system. Today, we are here to listen to his talk entitled Modeling Disease Progression and the Role of Microbial Community Dynamics. Hi everyone, I'm Nicholas Chia. I'm very happy to be here presenting at uh, the Systems Biology uh, Summer Symposium. Um, it is a great privilege and honor to be presenting here today. And I wanna to talk to you about some of my work uh, modeling disease uh, progression, particularly in colorectal cancer and the role of microbial community dynamics in uh, different disease progressions. Um, so, so my real interest in life is thinking about uh, life processes, right? And so in any kind of life process, it's some kind of dynamic process where stuff happens, right? Um, there are often many, many different entities involved uh, that interact with each other. Uh, something happens between these two things and that sets off a cascade of, of different stochastic events and that, that has been studied in, in many different areas in my life. And so when I was getting my PhD, I studied stochastic growth processes in the context of sequence alignment, right? Which you can think of as a growth process of an alignment score um, and mapping some of those processes from the Carter Parisi Zhang universality class uh, to solve things like the, the E value uh, in, in gapped pairwise alignments for BLAST, um, understanding host microbe interactions in, in colorectal cancer uh, and how microbes work together to create different metabolites, some of which could be beneficial or some of which could be harmful uh, to the colon and, and to the process of colon, colorectal cancer carcinogenesis. And then finally, um, really understanding just, just in general uh, how microbial community metabolism drives the ecosystem um, of, the, of the microbiome, right? How does it drive inclusion and exclusion of what's in that system? So I, I've included quite a bit of material and I hope we get to, to all of it. And so I'm going to uh, uh, talk very briefly and, and hope uh, people send me questions. So uh, this all comes from my interest in life where, where you notice that interactions order uh, every scale of life, right? And so some examples of this are our single, you know, biofilm species, this picture here of, of what a biofilm looks like. This is a one species biofilm. And you can see this very intricate three-dimensional structure um, that develops uh, on this biofilm um, with, and, and who knows why, right? With no real hider or order structure or brain that you can really think of, it just sort of spontaneously emerges uh, through the interactions that go on within that biofilm. You can see more uh, exotic examples of this in mixobacteria, fruiting bodies, uh, which, which grow these stalks and then these fruiting bodies on top to help replicate um, and, and, and therefore sacrificing the stalk cells in favor of the cells that end up in this fruiting body. And that's uh, some very elaborate uh, behavior there. And, and you know that microbes also can swarm, right? We, we've sort of all seen collective behavior and, and uh, papers on swarming. Um, and I, I like this example uh, of another system that seems to be able to uh, form spontaneous order uh, through, through maybe non-intelligent interactions, which is a human mosh pit, right? This, this is work done by some Cornell students who noticed that whenever you went uh, uh, to a mosh pit, whenever you went to a big party, a rock concert, um, mosh pits typically went counterclockwise 95% of the time and, and, and clockwise uh, only 5% of the time. And they could show that these mosh pits spontaneously emerge from just having a lot of energetic dancers that want to move around. 
And so, so I focus on microbes in my work because they're, they're one of the most important entities of, uh, we have on earth. Um, they really make up a large population of what, what is life and, and they determine um, a lot of our health, right? So there are more uh, gut, gut microbes on your body um, uh, than cells. And, and the world's microbial population is greater by a million fold than the uh, stars in the, in the known universe. So, so you know, uh, I, I guess about 15 years ago now, um, uh, the, the HMP, the, the Human Microbiome Project started where NIH really wanted to get a survey of all the different microbes all around the body and try to understand what they were. And this was a ginormous undertaking. And, and really they, they sampled everything from, as you can see, the eye where they didn't get very much uh, to the airway, to the GI tract, to, to the uh, urinogenital tract. And, and really with the goal of trying to, for the first time, map out what is the microbiome of our body. And, and we've known that, that it was important, but we didn't really appreciate how complex it was, right? And so what, what was found out in that, that survey uh, was that there were uh, many times more genes. So, so there were, first of all, this number of 100 species is probably way, way, way suppressed, right? I mean, this is, this is a, a falsely low number, but it's definitely greater than 100. It's probably more like 10,000 different species that exist inside of the human microbiome, depending on where you demark the species boundary between microbes. Um, oh, way over 2 million different kinds of genes, depending on what you, you think is a different gene, how different they need to be. Um, and what's really interesting is when you look at things that are very concrete, like metabolism or biochemical reactions, which you know have different functions or are different chemical structures, uh, you have uh, 10 times as many metabolites that exist inside of the microbiome um, and, and something like five times as many reactions, biochemical reactions that the microbiome can carry out. So the microbiome um, has, has way more uh, capacity for biochemical transformations than our own human cells do. And we in fact rely on that a lot. And we've known this for years in medicine. Uh, this is really old news that the, the microbiome within our gut is, is essential for converting indigestible food components, uh, producing essential nutrients that we need. Uh, it's responsible for stimulating the, the immune system um, and, and metabolizing certain medications, right? So, so medications that work better orally than intravenously, almost all of them have been revealed to be metabolized by the microbes. And that's why they need to be taken orally. Uh, and, and we're growing an appreciation for many more things that are happening right now uh, with the microbiome in our bodies. Um, turning on the host repair pathways is, is uh, also going on. You need the microbes in order to turn on some of those, just like you need them to stimulate the innate immune system. They, they play a role in, in uh, regulating cell proliferation. They also help us prevent infections. Um, through, through their ecology, right? The same way grass prevents weeds from growing in your lawn, it, it blocks them out. And they help us maintain barrier function inside of our, our GI tract and other epithelial surfaces. And, and the cancer microbiome interaction has, uh, uh, since the early days, has grown enormously in the literature, right? Um, you know, everything from blood cancers where, where the, the uh, production of short chain fatty acids plays a role in the spread of blood cancers, um, esophageal cancer, uh, breast cancer, which uh, you could think of as a, a potentially surprising one, although in retrospect, uh, maybe not. Um, H. pylori was the one classic example that was known and led to a Nobel Prize uh, something like 10 years ago. Um, Fusobacterium uh, and the skin uh, and skin cancer has been found to be linked. Uh, and, and colon cancer, of course, uh, in 2012 had two concurrent papers um, linking Fusobacterium nucleatum to colorectal cancer tissue. Um, and, and there's a very strong link between uh, uterine cancer and two microbial species. And, and when, we, when we think about cancer progressions, we usually think about the classic colorectal cancer uh, image given to us uh, in large part by Vogelstein, Bert Vogelstein. And, and, and for that reason, these are often called uh, a Vogelgram. And, and these days it's been expanded to include not only an adenoma carcinoma transition, which 
follows the classic uh, Vogelgram, originally by uh, Vogelstein and Fierson in, uh, in 1990, um, but also now includes this understanding of a sessile serrated adenoma to carcinoma pathway, which usually leads to deficient mismatch repair, colorectal cancers, um, and, and is driven by different driver events in that sequence. Uh, whoops, let's see. And, and as we're learning all these factors that play into uh, the, the carcinogenic process, right? The, the initiation, promotion, and progression of colorectal cancer, uh, we're learning that host genetics probably plays something like a, a 15, you know, 15 of the role, and that most of it is in fact something more mysterious in the 85% uh, bucket that we call environment, which includes everything from um, how your body is interacting with your colon cells um, to, to the stromal microenvironment, the immune cells, uh, the cell cell signaling within your body, um, your exposure to toxins, uh, and that includes the microbiome uh, and, and the exposure through microbially produced toxins, uh, metabolites, and, and diet, which we know affects, the micro, uh, affects your chances of colorectal cancer. So, so most colorectal cancer is sporadic, um, and even in the case of familial adenomas polyposis, which is a genetic predisposition that gives you colorectal cancer, that has also been found to be microbiome dependent uh, in, in a mouse model where you can knock out the microbes and see that you don't have as much colorectal cancer. Um, and, and ultimately it comes down to environment with a lot and a lot of complex interactions uh, between the host and the microbiome that, that help us determine uh, who gets colorectal cancer and when. So my particular hypothesis uh, was looking at um, uh, hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide production in colorectal cancer, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so just to summarize some of the work I've done here in the past on this area, uh, and I don't necessarily want to go into too much today because I want to uh, dedicate a lot of the time to the modeling efforts uh, that I think uh, make, make this uh, summer session more interesting and, and more special. Um, some of our work includes looking at statistical distributions uh, of the different uh, bacterial abundances in cancer, adenoma, and normal, and looking uh, for a power law distribution in particular that truncates too early. And by looking for a power law distribution that truncates artificially, that is, uh, according to the probabilities of and the numbers of samples you have, it should continue, but it doesn't, we can identify uh, the potential drivers of colorectal cancer, and we can do it robustly, not only in our cohort, but in any, any large cohort study. And, and we've shown we can do that, and we get similar results across both us and, and a study by Pierre Borg, which, which is uh, quite good because, because the methodologies can often be a little bit less robust than that. Um, we also have uh, invested time into uh, creating microbial metabolic uh, Metab metabolic modeling tools for communities, uh, for pairwise microbes. So MECOM is a tool uh, that allows you to um, take, take multiple microbes and, and try to understand how they grow together. Uh, this one is not actually our tool. We, we happen to use this one to, to run everything. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so, so running this tool uh, allowed us to show that the tumor cells were, were more we're more likely to uh, generate H2S uh, than normal or, or normal adjacent uh, microbial communities and, and allowed us to break this higher H2S production in tumors. So, so experimentally, we, after testing that in MECOM, we managed to, uh, to show that, um, in fact, by measuring the amino acids, which are our surrogate of H2S production, because H2S, measuring H2S directly is a problem because it's, it's uh, very volatile. So uh, your collection method um, and your collection timing and when you seal your sample, uh, the gases from your sample um, can, can greatly affect your H2S um, measurement. So we used amino acids uh, and mass spec in order to identify uh, microbially produced H2S. And we relied on the fact that there are certain amino acids that the microbes uh, create that we don't, and, and that H2S is uh, the biggest byproduct 
of those, those processes. So in particular, one of the forms of cystothionine and, and lanthionine um, are bacterial only. And you can see that uh, for both of these, they're, they're made more often in tumors than in normal uh, adjacent uh, cells. Um, and this seems to confirm our, hypo our hypothesis that H2S uh, is, is driving uh, colorectal cancer, particularly in um, deficient mismatch repair uh, colorectal cancers, which are in red here. The red solid bar is the deficient mismatch repair colorectal cancer, and the, uh, and the hashed um, bar is the normal, uh, and blue is uh, proficient mismatch repair colorectal cancer. So over the years, uh, we've, we've sort of taken this picture and we've, we've added to it as we've gone along. So we've seen that there's a very strong association with B. fragilis um, in this. And, and uh, there's a lot of work looking at it, creating a toxin, but we don't really see that. Instead, uh, we see the role of B. fragilis as, um, uh, as, as a primary fermenter that generates short chain fatty acids that modulate uh, the, the overall environment of growth for the uh, tumor. Um, we see it associated with uh, this hypermethylation, uh, particularly hypermethylation of MLH1, which gives rise to this deficient match repair colorectal cancer that um, then has many, many, many mutations across it uh, and, and often is associated with a very good candidate for something like um, immunotherapy. Um, so that, that in, in that sense uh, gives, gives that, that tumor pressure to escape uh, the immune system, right? So escape uh, uh, surveillance and escape sort of uh, being hunted down by your own immune system because it can start recognizing that those cells are different. Um, and this seems to actually lead to an interesting collaboration with Fusobacterium, uh, which can actually help it uh, suppress the immune system locally. Uh, or help it escape uh, the immune system there. Similarly, we see inside of the, the adenoma carcinoma sequence, uh, a small subset um, that have very high fusobacterium that we think may be playing a different role in that setting. Um, and, and that we see fusobacterium overall, uh, its strongest association is really with the sessile serrated adenoma. And if you include just all the proficient mismatch repair um, colorectal cancer, the association actually goes away uh, for the most part, except for these strong outliers with very high views of bacteria. All right, so, so here, here comes the interesting part of the talk, and, and hopefully I didn't rush through that too much, but, but this is what I really wanted to get to, is really understanding how do we use models to predict uh, different aspects of how microbiomes behave. And so the first question I'm going to ask is, can we use uh, metabolic models to predict um, the, the uh, ecological equilibrium, the, the equilibrium uh, environment or microbial profile probiotic in intervention? And that's a very interesting question because we want to very often understand with probiotics whether they're going to engraft or not. In other words, if you take a probiotic, you know, you, you get given a trillion you know, cells and you're taking these pills that you bought in the grocery store because they said they would restore your gut health or something like that, um, or they would make you a better athlete or, or whatever it is, you know, one of the first questions I think we ought to ask is, is that probiotic even having an effect on the ecology in your gut or not? And, and that's something we, we want to explore. And, um, and, and, you know, why, why is this such an important problem? Well, I like to joke that, uh, you know, you, you obviously can make it into science and nature and cell and all these things, but I guess you become a really, really big field um, when you make it into uh, The Economist and the cover of The Economist um, over and over again. And, and at that point, you realize that that's because it's almost a $50 billion industry in the US uh, worldwide, an even greater number, of course, and, and that there's a lot of serious research and uh, industrial investment um, in this space that makes it so important for us to understand what's actually going on here and how to make more effective probiotics. So when you're adding something to the microbiome, um, here's how you can think of it, right? Uh, you, you imagine that for the different microbes um, in, in some kind of sequence space, they have some kind of uh, fitness criteria, and, and let's, let's assume the fitness criteria in this case is something like the reproduction rate. And, and of course, if you're 
uh, at, at a local optimum, um, that's good for you. That means you're more likely to uh, be able to engraft. And, and there's some kind of general picture of a fitness landscape for microbiomes to colonize your gut. Uh, and, and if you thought that uh, the host was the entity that was really um, exerting global selection pressure, right? Um, then that would make sense, right? You would think the host is trying to domesticate microbes that benefit itself. And so all you need to do then is you need to just put in a microbe that benefits the host and the host will take that selection pressure and drive it forward. And that perhaps generously, that seems to be the model that um, many probiotic companies are operating under. Um, they're assuming if it's good for you, they'll give it to you, and, and that if it is good for you, it'll, it'll settle in and it'll work and, and everything will be fine. However, that, that doesn't seem to be um, working necessarily. And, and we know that because we, we have microbes that we know uh, are associated with good gut health, and we can take microbes like, um, like uh, uh, bifidobacterium, which is, which is universally thought of as a good microbe, and uh, after being given a, a very strict regimen of these, these probiotics, only 36% of the, uh, the participants in a clinical trial uh, have bifidobacterium persist in their guts after 28 days, and only 27% after 166 days. In other words, uh, if you were to take a probiotic um, and, and take it for, for a, a trial period, there's only a one-third chance that that would make any lasting contribution to your gut. And so the question I want to ask is what interactions mediate global cooperation um, between microbes and, and how do the microbes themselves perhaps allow um, different species into the gut microbiome um, and how does it do it? And so the mystery of probiotic engraftment is really to understand what mechanism drives the long-term exclusion or inclusion of a gut microbial species, uh, and how can we target or design better probiotics and, and failure and success. So um, many of you may be familiar with the Laca Volterra model. The Laca Volterra model is basically a pairwise interaction model uh, where, where all interactions um, are, are uh, either help growth or hurt growth uh, in the presence of two species. So, so if you have uh, one species uh, A and you have a species B that cooperate to both grow faster, you might have a term, you know, you'll have logistic growth plus an additional term that speeds up that growth. And, and you know, that's, that's an interesting model, um, but we don't really know how to fit that model all the time. Uh, and, and we don't have, always have the data to fit that model. And, and ultimately, when we try to apply that to many different people, we, we usually can make it work, but we have to change and, and refit the parameters every single time. So it's not a very good model, right? Because we can fit it many different ways and, and it's, uh, it's perhaps not, not a great model on its own. On the other hand, uh, the growth of genome scale metabolic models, that is taking um, each individual microbial species or cell uh, and treating it like a bioreactor with hundreds or thousands of reactions within it uh, and, and using flux balance analysis to uh, calculate and predict what um, metabolism uh, that species will, uh, will undergo um, has been a really large emerging field uh, founded by, by Bernard Paulson that has shown wide success in being able to work at least on the single species level, right? So now we'd like to expand that into communities. Um, now, it, it has been attempted, of course, to, to use metabolic modeling uh, directly in, in an entire community, um, but that also has some issues. Uh, that, that often does not work well because either people treat everything as if it's in one compartment or on the other side, it often has difficulties uh, just because the updates are so incredibly expensive and, and we have work on that too that I'm not gonna go into. Um, but we need to find something that's more of an intermediate model, right? Something that is going to allow us to understand the interactions between microbes without us having to simulate the entire system at once. So, so the heart of the Laca Volterra model is really understanding these pairwise interactions. And what our work does is it proposes to understand these pairwise interactions. This is an example uh, from Will Harcomb's paper um, of a pairwise interaction. And, and 
what we're uh, doing is we're we're uh, seeing if we can use metabolic uh, modeling to to mimic these these interactions. Uh, and so this is nice because it uses mechanistic knowledge that is transferable. That is, however an E. coli behaves in this setting, um, its metabolic model should be transferable to another setting. And, and so we would like to use these genome scale metabolic models, which are called GEMS, um, to provide that sort of transferable and mechanistic knowledge across lockable Terra models, uh, leading us to better sort of uh, generalizable ecological models. And by generalizable, I mean uh, to, to many different people and situations. And so without going into too many of the details here, um, we, we employed a, our own, um, methodology for more accurately determining the community metabolic interactions using resource allocation constraints. Uh, and we found that to be much better. Um, and we managed to show that uh, for many different circumstances, such as this one, where we have the data um, post uh, pre and post trial. Uh, so we know what their microbiome is before the trial starts, and we know what their microbiome is after the trial ends. And we can, we can based on uh, what's there before, we can make a prediction about what's going to engraft and not engraft. And we can do this not only um, for bifidobacterium longum, but we can do this for other species as well. Uh, we, we overall get some decent um, accuracy and performance uh, when we're using different Locke of Volterra modeling schemes, right? And so uh, just to break this down for you, this CD block here is a block of uh, C. difficile simulations where you can see that almost any methodology we use with metabolic modeling um, is able to perfectly classify uh, engrafters and non-engrafters um, in, this, in this mouse study. Uh, where they were looking at susceptible microbiomes. Um, and then you have this uh, Bifidobacterium longum study, and you can see that the, the model that performs the best here is basically the antagonistic Locke Volterra model, which, which uh, basically uh, shifts the, the interaction scores in such a way to make sure that you don't have any numerical blowups and things like that. So that's more of a technical uh, aside, but, but nonetheless, you see that this, this principle works surprisingly well. Um, so you're looking at performance across uh, uh, different strains um, that we used because we didn't know exactly the model strain that they used in the, in the um, experiment. Uh, but you can see even trying all these different model strains, it looks like they're, they, they all uh, you know, are, are able to provide some kind of um, positive predictive performance. And, and the same here with um, uh, this, this other study um, looking at lacto uh, plantarium, um, you also see good performance as well. And in this, so these are, these are AUCs. And so this is, this is some kind of, uh, uh, measure of how accurately we're predicting who engrafts and who doesn't. Um, and, and I want to uh, emphasize here that uh, this is quite remarkable because we're not putting in um, any additional information, right? The information for these predictions is coming purely from the metabolic and uh, from, from essentially metabolic modeling resources. Right, such as model seed or virtual microbial human, uh, and and that's it. We're not inject, inject, injecting any information, and we're not uh, fitting any free parameters, um, and and so that that makes it a very very powerful model with positive predictive performance. And this was done largely by uh, uh, Jim Brunner now in Lanel, um, and I visited him a few weeks ago, and he's continuing this work. Um, they've they've hired him to. Uh, try to extend this work to the, the environment um, overall uh, and, and try to understand what's, what's happening as, as uh, global warming takes hold. All right, so what we managed to show in this work was that a, uh, a, a genome uh, scale model model uh, what managed to inform micro micro models for ecology and they are uh, at least partially successful, they, they seem actually surprisingly successful considering they're a zero parameter model. Um, there, there is one resource allocation parameter, but, but that one is actually fixed according to what gives you the biggest uh, coexistence um, in, in that setting. 
uh, so it's not entirely a free parameter either. Uh, species, species, resource allocation parameters, um, species specific resource allocation parameters in the future might be beneficial because it is kind of hard to imagine that every species is just one number in terms of how it allocates its resources, but we don't have those kinds of measurements. Uh, but, but one day, if we do have a lot of pairwise experiments or something like that, we could extend the approach to make it sort of more beneficial. Um, and, and this sort of uh, leads us to this idea that uh, one day uh, using a met metabolite mediated model um, in conjunction with genome scale metabolic models may give us something that's even better than Locke of Altera. In other words, explicitly modeling the metabolites as, as the agents uh, in the system. All right, so on to the next uh, topic. Um, so, so now shifting over from that very, very mechanistic model, um, that's very interesting, but it doesn't always work, right? Because we don't always have the mechanism and that, that can be a problem sometimes. And so, so that made me think about some of these other environments uh, like the vaginal microbiome, where we don't have food and we don't have diet, and we don't have those things going on. Um, and to ask the question, well, how could we model those environments, right? Uh, what is the model complexity needed to articulate microbial community dynamics in settings where we can't rely on mechanistic information. So in, in you know, this comes out of work that was done with, uh, in collaboration with Wellesley College and my colleague Mark Tuttel uh, and his team over there um, through, through the work of two years and a lot of work by Stephanie Song. Uh, who is now uh, an MD PhD student in, uh, in Mount Sinai. Uh, she worked in my lab for two years analyzing this data and also helping drive the collection over in Wellesley. Uh, and, and really through all of that, we got 26 participants and 1,192 uh, microbiome profiles. Um, these 26 participants were asked to take daily vaginal swabs uh, for about a period of two months um, with a spring break in the middle. And, and this becomes a very interesting question because there's so many external drivers of the, the vaginal biota. Unlike it's not, it's probably not, uh, uh, you know, diet and, and food and things we can measure, right? Um, it, it is more driven by micro microbe interactions uh, or interactions with the host. So things like chemical warfare and pH uh, changes, the lactobacilli are known to uh, essentially acidify the environment and drive out competitors. And, and so, so now we have to try to understand the effect of all of these different components um, without having the benefit of really being able to model the mechanism directly like we were before. And, and so these daily uh, vaginal swabs, if you look at the microbiome program and, and sort of a bar plot of their relative abundance, many of you may have seen these kinds of plots before, but just to recap, uh, the, the, the thickness of this individual color is the amount, uh, the, the relative abundance or the amount that microbe takes up space-wise or percentage-wise inside of the microbiome. And, and you can see that there are daily fluctuations that occur regularly and, and sometimes not, right? Sometimes you have a very dominant lactobacilli that can suddenly shift into a different lactobacilli or, or the environment can make these sort of large radical shifts. You should notice these red triangles down here. So these are the weeks of the study. Noticing these red triangles down here, um, these are uh, days where the participants noted that they had menses. So this is when blood is being introduced into the environment. And you can see that these are often the days on which there is a radical shift uh, in the microbiome, sometimes a complete change, like in this case, a switch from uh, uh, L inners, it looks like over here to uh, L gasseri. Um, and then, and then uh, you know, over here as well, where there's, there's a big dip later on. Actually, it looks like streptococcus, my apologies trying to sort out my colors here. Um, let's see. Yes, okay. So, so then, you know, here's some more examples of the same thing and you can see people who are very stable and very unstable. And we have to contend with all of this to try to understand what's going on. Finally, uh, uh, you know, we, the work that Stephanie did in this showed that these menses were actually very important. There was an increase in diversity right around menses, um, and that if you put people on sort of a normalize their cycle by their menstrual cycle, you actually 
and key differences based on what contraception they took, uh, what kind of hormones were involved in that con contraception, essentially. And, and you, could, you could look for uh, this 28-day sort of uh, periodicity in the system um, related to the microbial populations. So to try to model this, you know, the goal of this was really to see if we could get, understand the population dynamics using a neural network. Uh, and the, the neural network we chose for this was called the long short-term memory cell. Um, and it's a type of recurrent neural network that basically allows you to monitor a cell state and allows you to uh, forget things about the state, allows you to input things into the state, allows you to output information based on that cellular state. Um, so, so it keeps track of a long-term state. And, and, and that's the reason why it's called the long short-term memory cells, because it has that uh, that idea of maintaining some memory of what happened before in the time steps before and, and having that feed into uh, your prediction on the next time step. And, and overall, what you're trying to do is you're trying to, um, oops, you're trying to take information uh, from a certain number of time steps, in our case, 14. So we go from T0 to T13. Uh, this is a diagram stolen from TensorFlow, so forgive the number there. But we go up to 14 over here. And, uh, and then we wanna make a prediction at t equals 14, the 15th time step. Um, and, and we happen to know uh, what that value is, right? But we wanna understand uh, what, how this model could learn based on looking at a certain number of time steps before what will happen next. And so this is how we set up our training, 14 time points of training with one prediction at the end. And then we, we train it to get better and better at that prediction using this data. And then we have a, a, a test set. Test this so training data is a very small amount of the data because we need most of it for the training. Um, but we hold out uh, one 28-day um, trajectory. And what we do with that is we feed in the first 14 days, uh, and then we predict what happens the next 14 days, and we compare. All right. So here's an example result from that. And what you can see uh, is that the testing loss is expected, goes down rapidly and then slows down. Um, you know, you can think of this as, I guess, maybe kind of like the memorization and forgetting period. Uh, and, and that the testing loss, you know, is, is similar, right? It, it goes down and then it's a bit stochastic after that. And what we can do is we can, um, uh, what we do is we, we sort of draw a line here at 225 epochs and say, let's look for the best result after 225 epochs because early on uh, the models are not very articulate. They're, they're sort of these flat lines or smooth curves. And, and we really wanna see uh, if the model can fit these different fluctuations in behavior. And so here's one of the example results we have. And you can see that um, the solid lines here are the real data and the dotted lines are the predictions. The relative abundance is rescaled so that um, the average relative abundance for each uh, microbe across the entire training set sits at zero. Um, and, and I've plotted it rescaled because it's actually easier to see the separation between these different lines. Uh, and, and you could see that the, um, you could see that the predictions match uh, reasonably well, right? So, so that's, that's pretty good for, for the inners, uh, the, the Gasserae and the and L. crispatus, so the major species seem to be matching. Um, and we can do this over and over again. We can see we get reasonable results uh, overall. And then we can also look at all the other species uh, in, the, in the vaginal uh, microbiome as well. Um, and this is, this is a, a snapshot of what we have in these cases. And you can see that this seems to work pretty well, uh, not for every species, but overall, it seems to make pretty reasonable predictions. Okay, so what's the goal of that? So we can predict it. We're not really trying to predict what happens you know, to, to uh, the vaginal microbiome uh, forward in time necessarily. What we're really using this to is to see, one, can we model it? And two, if we can model it, can we use it to learn something? And, and this is where um, we start uh, doing a little bit of a, a, a ablation experiment in some way. And, and what I really mean by that is not destroying the network, but what I really mean is uh, removing data. So creating a missing data uh, entity, right? So putting in missing data and then seeing how that affects the interaction um, or the prediction on the other side. And, and through that, you can understand how at least the network believes microbes are interacting with each other. And so on the, in the um, 
rows over here, the row labels, uh, these are all of the microbes that you just saw. And these are uh, these indicate the inputs. Um, and then down uh, in the columns, these indicate the outputs. So when you see something like lactobacillus, uh, lactobacilli crispatus, uh, and you see this, this uh, stronger uh, mark on the heat map for L inners, that means that L crispatus is in fact very important to the L inners prediction. In other words, if I change the L crispatus value, that changes my prediction of L inners quite sizably. Not surprisingly, L inners uh, affects L inners the most, um, and L gasseri affects L gasseri. And there is, you know, it's it's faded in here, but there is there is a sense of a diagonal here. But you already get some interesting substructure out of this. In fact, you see that there are there's a strong interaction with between L inners and L crispatus, which we believe to be <coughs> we believe to be competitive inside of the vaginal microbiome. Um, and then the other lactobacilli seem, seem to form a, a different interaction with each other as well. Interestingly, this matches our conception that L. crispatus is, um, is, is competitive and suppresses uh, many, much of the microbial diversity. As you can see, it has an effect on, on many of the other microbes uh, in, that, uh, in the vaginal microbiome. And we can do this over and over again, and we can get an ensemble. Uh, and through that, we can start learning what the overall interactions are, uh, hopefully um, in the future, leading to us being able to build a population model that is more mechanistic and able to tell us about the ecology of the vaginal microbiome. Interestingly, we um, so, so if we do this ensemble, this is what we get. Uh, and, and we also can do this across time. So I can remove the data from different time steps and you could see which data is more important. Uh, and, and you can do this oops, um, many times as well and, and get an average, which is what this is. All right. So the conclusions are that, uh, that PM is capable of capturing Lyme talk time longitudinal dynamics sufficiently from a very limited data set, right? I told you there are about a thousand data points here and that seems like a lot for any microbiome study, um, but for anyone who works uh, with, you know, recurrent neural networks, you know, something like a million seems like a reasonable number. Um, something like a thousand seems very unreasonable. So, so the fact that it works with just a thousand uh, samples tells us that there is in fact a very, um, strong relationship in, inside of that data that, that uh, makes this work. So it's doable, um, especially for a many parameter model, we use a hidden layer size of 30 and a depth of uh, three. So, so, um, so there are 90 nodes in this, 90 LSTM uh, nodes in this. Um, it's, it's difficult to assess the interactions. Uh, some of it depends on architecture. There are endless possibilities there, but but we we can start gleaming some of the uh, uh, facts of this um, and, and start understanding what some of the vaginal microbiome interactions are. And, and so, nonetheless, this is a potentially useful tool for confirming ecological relationships. Um, area that we continue to explore, uh, and and this is uh, an area that you also can can link up with experimentation as well. All right. So, so that's one dynamic. Uh, so I gave you one approach, which was purely mechanistic. Can we build a, a mechanistic model off of um, my, microbial uh, metabolism? Can I build a model or start understanding how to build a model off of no data at all, but just time longitudinal data? And now I'm going to give you a third very interesting case here and that I want to close with, which is what if you have partial information about the dynamic? Um, and, and partial information about the mechanism, how can you build a predictive model of evolution in this case, we're looking at colorectal cancer evolution from observational data. And, and in some ways, you know, you, you think that, that that approach probably has got to be the best because you have a little bit of both kinds of information, but it's actually one of the harder ones to think about how to model, right? When you have these pure cases, it's, it's uh, easier to think about. So here we're turning to look at the colorectal cancer evolution problem, right? And in this case, we know that histologically it goes from normal epithelium to early dysplasia and adenoma to larger adenomas, to late adenomas to cancerous cells, right? Um, and it becomes a cancerous tumor. And, and this was uh, studied by Fierson and Vogelstein in 1990. They published, um, you know, the, uh, 
the the what's now called the Vogelgram, and, and they publish the, the canonical order of mutations that occurs in colorectal cancer. Um, and this, is, this has been sort of the established literature since then. But, you know, we continue to try to get better th at that, and that's very difficult. Um, and, and there have been many, many models of how evolution and selection in colorectal cancer work. Right there's the linear model, which is which is very similar to to Vogelstein's model. Um, there's been a lot of big bang type models, uh, um, as proposed by by Curtis in uh, in Stanford. Um, you know that that all have sort of uh, slow driver mutations early on, followed by a big explosion of mutations, um, also called the neutral niche model. Uh, there's a parallel selection model in IBD where um, you're, you're sort of arresting development for a certain amount of time, and that leads to large exposure uh, to, to potential mutations that, that then, once that goes away, can lead to uh, sort of a lot of parallel experiments in evolution. Um, and there's age accumulated neutral, and, and the list goes on and on, right? This is an open question. We, we, we still don't understand uh, in, to, to large extent um, in any finer detail than Vogelstein did how we can, how we, we should think about colorectal cancer evolution and, and cancer evolution in general. Some of the other approaches that have been used include tumor subpopulation, or, or a lot of these approaches are based on tumor subpopulation phylogeny. Uh, in theory, the, the goal is to reconstruct the history of an individual tumor cell. And then from there, you can hope to find patterns of what that evolution is. There, are a few issues with it. It relies on taking a tumor sample, looking at heterogeneity within that sample. That is, some of the cells have different mutations from other cells, and therefore these mutations have different frequencies within that tumor. So you could see that this purple star um, occurs the most often. So this is probably a very early mutation, right? Uh, and then, and then you can see that some of these other things don't occur in as big of the population, like this triangle here. Uh, so that probably occurs later. It always occurs with a purple star, so they probably come together in some way, and so on and so forth. And you use that information to infer uh, uh, an ordering of um, of the evolutionary events and and a determination of the genetic subclones uh, within within a, a tumor. And so this, this is a little bit difficult though, because there are actually many degenerate solutions to this, right? There's not like, if you take one sample, you can solve this at all. We are starting to use single cell technology, so that can help solve a lot of these problems, but still overall, when you're looking at a bulk sample, you really can't determine uniquely the solution here. And, and because, they're, uh, because you're sampling part of the tumor and not getting the, the frequencies in the whole tumor, you, you very often also have this, this problem trying to rely on these variant allele frequencies. So it's a little bit of a, uh, you, you, do, you don't necessarily have the perfect solution and you have, you have um, uh, potential for, for some errors. Uh, and, and when you, and, and the other really, really, pain the neck problem with it is, let's say even if you were perfect, right? Even if you had you know, single cell data, um, the, the problem is that the histories don't tell us what drives the cancer. They just end up with histories. And in fact, when we look at a history, a set of histories based on a model uh, that, that, was, um, that involved a polyp of origin uh, being still attached to the cancer. So you think we'd be able to sample the adenoma and the cancer itself in order to get two time points in this evolution. You actually see every evolutionary pattern that's possible. Uh, you see stepwise, which matches uh, Vogelstein and Fierson. You see parallel evolution where the adenoma doesn't seem to have that much to do with the cancer. Maybe it was an early split. You see just neutral chaos and, and you see that eruptive evolution. So basically everything that can happen does happen seemingly. Uh, and and we we want to study this question of selection pressure, right? We don't we're not satisfied just with a historical reconstruction because this problem seems more complex than just trying to look at histories and align them. Uh, and, and so um, you know we we want to ask a different question: How can we build a model of selection pressure from observational data instead of merely reconstructing the tree? So once again, just to go over selection pressure, you have a fitness landscape, a reproductive rate, um, and, and some kind of sequence space or basically different cells. Um, 
And you know, you can imagine a cell with no mutations has a certain fitness. Um, but if you get a mutation, maybe it'll start growing and out competing that. Um, but what's what's really interesting there is now that can actually change the selection pressure because the cell has changed. Maybe it brings uh, it recruits immune cells to the environment to to kill it or whatever. Now it now it actually has a lower reproduction rate because it's changed the environment in some critical way. But it continues to mutate and 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 find new optima. So, so this, this scenario I just drew is sort of what we see here in the tree, um, you know, could be one of the explanations for what's going on in the tree. And we really want to uh, use this to figure this out. And in particular, uh, it's, it's this area under this, this yellow um, shape here. So how do we learn a system um, that potentially changes its rules move by move? Right, that's that's a very difficult system to think about for for most models, uh, but but this is just the reality of where it goes. So the way we did it was we thought of cancer as a game where the cancer cells are winners and the normal cells uh, are the losers. Um, and so what we mean by that is that every cell that made it as a subclone within this cancer tumor in in some way won the game of cancer. Right, it, it managed to reproduce successfully. Uh, and, and so every terminal subclone inside of the tree in that case is a winner. And what we're trying to learn are the actions and states that were most influential uh, for that winning state at the end. And, and uh, we can think of each path from the normal cell and the mutations that, that take it to the different um, subclonal states here uh, to be some the, the winning path the, uh, if you think of this as a game, this is the expert gameplay. This is the expert demonstration of a game of how to win the game of cancer. And, and for those of you who are familiar with um, AlphaGo, you, know, you can think of uh, this cancer problem in some ways as, as sort of a, a more complex version of the game of Go. Uh, where there are many combinatorial uh, moves, many board configurations, many different strategies to win, um, except that uh, the, the, both the state space and the action space are evolving concurrently in this case, right? And, and so we know that this is, this is just an enormous problem and, and in fact was considered an uncomputable problem um, because the, the size of the decision tree of a game of Go is too large to be computed by, by all the computers on Earth. Um, and so, so they had to rely on different techniques in order to try to understand the complex dynamics behind Go. And one of the techniques they, they looked at was the use of a reward function. So the use of um, reinforcement learning uh, to try to understand um, how to play that, that really large game of Go. And so what we wanna do is we want to use the same paradigm. In particular, we're going to use the inverse reinforcement learning, which is what AlphaGo used to initialize its learning. Uh, and from that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to watch expert behavior and we're trying to uh, recover the reward function that describes that behavior. So, so in more layman terms, you can imagine that uh, the different cells or different tumors have many different reward functions. Um, you know, some cells might want to in, or incentivize growth, so they might want to outgrow everyone around them. They, they might want to avoid the immune system, right? They might want to hijack the energy sources. We actually know this happens, right? That some cancers can make us more diabetic and, and basically uh, pump more sugar into our blood so that they can get more food. Um, or, or they might recruit microbes uh, to, to somehow help their ability to metastasize or, or reduce chemo drug efficacy, right? Which is, which is another thing that we know can happen. Um, so, so the question becomes watching this expert behavior, how can I use that in order to recover a reward function that will describe um, the evolution of that tumor? And so, so using inverse reinforcement learning uh, seems like the obvious choice here, right? It, it uh, allows each independent agent to be encoded as uh, a Markov decision process, an MDP, and, um, and, and it allows us to not have to manually uh, specify the entire reward model um, and instead watch the cancer behave and, and learn the reward model in this case, which is very important because remember, we only have partial information. We know it's an evolutionary dynamic, but we don't really understand how to fit all the parameters of that evolution. And so we're asking this algorithm to do it for us. 
uh, there were some technical challenges to this. Um, and, and because we solved some of these technical challenges, uh, we, we uh, won honorable mention for best paper uh, in, in triple AI, um, for AI and social impact. So we were one of the top papers in that conference. So that we're very proud of this, um, but I'm not gonna go into the challenges in too much depth here, um, just the results, but the challenges were that we had a non-uniform sampling of the different uh, reward functions and we didn't know how many reward functions there were to begin with. And, and so we solved that um, using uh, what we call a pop-up restaurant inverse reinforcement learning process uh, that I'm just gonna briefly go over um, but but it's uh, basically it uses the Chinese restaurant process over and over again, which is why we call it the pop up restaurant process. Uh, and, and it's basically testing out different partitions of the expert demonstrations um, in order to uh, uh, generate those reward functions. And so the way the Chinese restaurant process in this case works is you have your expert demonstrations, um, they get seated at a table, they're a customer coming into a Chinese restaurant getting seated at a table. Um, oh, I should mention, I, I had someone uh, mention to, to my postdoc who I did this work with, John Kalantari, that this sounded horribly racist, but Chinese restaurant process is actually the name of the process, right? That is the name of the computational process. It is as opposed to like the Indian buffet process or other things. So, so the main takeaway is that uh, computer scientists like to eat at Asian restaurants um, and they often come in alone and then they have to be seated at a table with other people. Um, so so the, the next customer comes in also has to be seated at a table and with a certain probability gets seated either at the same table or at a new table. And this goes on and on. And this helps you partition the different expert demonstrations. And, and you can then assess which tables are the most appropriate tables by looking by, by using the expert demonstrations to update the reward function and see how reflective these are of each other. And of course, um, you know, the, the probabilities can depend on the similarities um, of the different uh, expert uh, demonstrations. And, and this is how you sort of stochastically uh, create a seating arrangement in a Chinese restaurant process um, that partitions the, the, the input data appropriately. And we do this over and over again because we're sampling many, many different possible partitionings. Um, and so we're popping up many, many of these restaurants. All right. Um, so after we do all of that, uh, we, we take each patient, we sample their tumor and their normal cells, we generate phylogenies. So as I mentioned, there are multiple solutions for each one of these. So we generate one to 10 phylogenies that seem to fit fairly well using phylo WGS for each patient. Um, and then for each of these, we break each path down this tree into an expert demonstration. Um, and so each tree gives us something like uh, five to 10, you know, or three to 10, uh, expert demonstrations. And we take all of those expert demonstrations, we partition them into different reward functions, and we learn these reward functions. And in our case, we use 27 patients. So we did this from near 27 patients. What we managed to show is that pure IRL is capable of learning the exact Vogelgram out of all of the possible um, genes. So just to uh, be really clear here, the action space here involves a thousand genes. Um, that were, were chosen uh, based on um, an oncology database. Um, thousand genes that can be mutated or methylated. Uh, so there are 2000 possible actions. Um, and the state space uh, is, is 14, we, we compress this into 14 states using a, a generalized latent uh, feature model. Um, just to just to cap the computation sum. And out of all of that, we, what we can then look at is what is the most likely action from the normal state? What is the most likely action from the state that occurs after that? And what is the most likely action or the most rewarded action that occurs after that? And, and out of all of those possible um, paths and, and different trajectories you can take in this system, uh, which, is, which is something like two to the 2000, uh, within the top two predictions, our first prediction is ABCKRAS TP53. Our second one is ABCKRAS SMAD4 TP3. And this second one out of this enormous space is exactly uh, what was determined in 1990. So we managed to learn the ground truth with just, 20, with just data from 27 patients and no additional intermediary samples. We only had the endpoint tumor and this very messy um, phylogenetic information. So, 
So this is a grand success. And then we started looking at what are some of the other early critical mutations um, that it pulls up. Uh, and for the top three, um, ARID1A, ACAP9, and OBSCN, uh, we found uh, robust literature across all three um, that all recently described these as early driver mutations, and either, uh, either through a meta-analysis across many studies or through experimental evidence. And so we feel very comfortable that Pure IRL is actually helping us uh, uncover early driver uh, mutations um, and, and seems to be a good paradigm. The IRL paradigm seems to be a powerful paradigm for understanding cancer evolution and etiology. So uh, just to conclude, um, you know, cancer evolutionary trajectories uh, can be treated as expert demonstrations for learning a reward function. We managed to prove this paradigm works. The interesting thing about it is a reward function is not only a descriptive paradigm, but is also the basis of a generative model. You can use a reward function to then actually play the game of cancer and play it into the future. So therefore predicting future cancer evolution, and that is something that, that we're probing very deeply right now. Um, <laughs> the, this was all done, I should mention, for, for those of you who are familiar with RL, almost nobody uses the tabular approach anymore, right? But the tabular approach is where you list all your states and all your actions, and, and your reward uh, function is a uh, state by action um, matrix, essentially. Uh, and, and in our case, it was sort of ridiculously large. We had to use um, some, some fairly large compute for this. Uh, and, and you know, one of the next steps is to actually replace this with a functional approximator, and uh, and I would I, I'm continuing to collaborate on that and work on that um, using different embedding spaces, uh, and and there's there's future potential here to combine this work with things like uh, uh, Boolean specifications for elucidating you know approximate sets of rules for cancer progression, which which could really help us un, um, condense our understanding of how cancer works into into something more manageable. All right, so with that, um, I'm just going to uh, sort of summarize some of my future plans, which are really to uh, investigate the role of my microbial metabolites on cancer evolutionary dynamics, um, expand these metabolite mediated models, uh, you know, continue to work on time longitudinal prediction for unknown or, or non-quantified interactions, so unknown systems, uh, and, then, and then try to leverage uh, pan cancer multiomics and clinical data for, for multimodal learning um, and, and extend the pure IRL concept uh, into a generative model for how, how cancer could possibly work. Uh, with that, I just want to thank everyone for listening to this talk. Uh, this was work built um, with a lot of help, of course, uh, across many, many different people in my lab. This is a picture I imagine, as, as many of you can imagine, this is a pre-COVID picture. A lot of these people have moved on since then. Um, John became an assistant professor and then moved on to start his own startup. So he became an assistant professor and quit uh, already. Um, Jim is at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, Min Suck did a lot of the, the resource allocation constraint modeling. Um, Patricio Geraldo helped with the bioinformatics of all of it. Nancy Scott grew organoids and, and helped look at many of the experiments. Jennifer Martin uh, helped us uh, consent patients for, for these studies. Uh, and then Stephanie Song did, did all of the Wellesley work over here with, with her colleagues in Wellesley. Um, there was a lot of collaboration uh, with Mohammed El Kabir um, in particular on this work because he's, he's the expert in uh, generating phylogenetic trees uh, and a host of other characters that we worked with um, across Argonne National Lab, Baylor. And of course, this couldn't have been possible without funding uh, from, from many different uh, sources, including uh, benefactors, NCI, um, AWS, um, Frontier Development Lab, and, and Argonne National Lab. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicolas Chia, for your talk. Now we have time for a few questions.
Hi everyone, my name is Diego Esquivel. We are here for to hear the last talk from the first day of our symposium. We are welcome to present Dr. De Kang. Dr. De Kang re received his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Wisconsin Madison in 2009. Since January 2019, serves an assistant professor at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the University of Toledo, United States. Dr. Kang is broadly interested in the employing multiomics technologies and bioinformatics to advance understanding of the role of microbiota on environmental engineering systems, nature, and human health, and eventually to improve human public health and environment sustainability. Today, we are here to listen his talk on successful microbiota transfer therapy to modulate good microbiome and treat autism symptoms. Thank you so much, Dr. Kang. Hi, my name is Deu Kang, assistant professor at University of Toledo. It is my great honor and pleased uh, to present uh, the pro uh, presentation titled Successful Microbiota Transfer Therapy to Modulate Gum Microbiome and Treat Autism Symptoms. Before I moved to University of Toledo, uh, I was in the Arizona State University. This project was done when I was in ASU as a postdoctoral and also the research scientist. I want to acknowledge the, uh, my former advisor, Dr. Rosa Kakamali Brown, and then Jim Adams, and many collaborators, and then funding agency from the Bayer and MC Foundation, and also Finch. Autism spectrum disorders or disorder of neural development. Surprisingly, the case of diagnosis has uh, increased uh, significantly in the last few decades up to one out of 54 children. They can suffer from communication, behavior, sociability, but surprisingly, there is no approved uh, treatment and also no biomarkers for early diagnosis. When people heard about autism, people thought about genetic factors could be a main driving force, but uh, from this research on the uh, Hemmeyer 2011, not only genetic, but environmental factors like the toxic, current, toxic chemicals and other environmental factors could play an important role on autism prevalence. This project was initiated uh, the conversation between the Dr. Adams and then Rosa, Dr. Rose Clark and Valley Brown. Dr. Adams has a preliminary data that the children with autism has somehow has a more gastrointestinal problems like the constipation and diarrhea. As you see in the graph on the x-axis is the score of GI problems. So higher scores means the more GI problems, uh, which is the y-axis. And then x-axis is the study of the uh, autism symptoms. So as you see in the positive correlation here, the children with has a more like the uh, behavior symptoms has a more GI problems. So at the time, Dr. Jim Adams was wondering, maybe the children with autism has a different gut environment, maybe different gum microbiome. So at the time that he approached to Dr. Rosa Krakenberg Baron, and then asked us uh, to look into like, the gum microbiome community. And when I, I was in the, uh, as a research scientist there. Gum micro, uh, human intestine has a lot of the microbes, so trillions of different types of the microbes. And then the, that somehow they communicate with the human host in many ways. It could be also related to brain. Although nowadays uh, people are trying to relate the gut and brain, many the uh, human disorders and disease, but back then the, there was not quite much idea about whether there is a correlation, any relation between autism and brain, autism and gut microbiome. So what is the role of a human gut microbiota? There are good bacteria or also beneficial bacteria, 
or there are also pathogenic bacteria. They do the different things, but when they are bad, where the beneficial bacteria kind of dominated, and then they really kind of be a good role for the human host health. Then which microbes have a role related to autism? When we start like looking into microbiome community, at that time there are not many, uh, there were not many studies. So some studies mostly focus on pathogenic bacteria. So maybe certain toxin, the producing bacteria like the Clostridium and Sutrella species may kind of trigger the autistic but those are somehow like the, it's a small studies and focus on uh, some specific bacteria. So the Dr. Rose Krakenbari Brown and Dr. Adams and I look into the microbial community in the fecal samples from the children with autism. So we recruited uh, 20 neurotypical kids, another way is a typically developed children, and then 20 children with autism. So we performed the next generation sequencing that allows a very uh, consist, uh, comprehensive understanding of a gut microbiome. So first observation that we found it is that uh, children with autism has a very low diverse microbiome, which is shown as a, a phylogenetic distance index. As you see in the graph, the blue, which is the neurotypical or typ typically developed children has a more a uh, number of more different types of gut microbiome, which is very important because the, maybe the more diverse the microbiome has kind of shared a, a good, important and beneficial role for the human host. So this is kind of the one uh, signature that we found in the study. And another uh, the signature that we found, Prevotella uh, was signif significantly reduced or uh, the missing. Uh, in the gut of children with autism. And then we confirmed that with the quantitative real-time PCR as well. So Prevotella may be the beneficial bacteria, but it's missing in children with autism. And as you see in this network analysis, Prevotella is represented by the yellow color, which is in the central in the networks. So in case of Prevotella is missing, maybe children with autism have a loose some solo important like the metabolic functions that could be provided by the gum microbiota. So that we wonder those are two signa uh, signature of gum microbiome, diversity and then Prevotella, which is really consistent or reproduced by another cohort. And then we tried uh, to recruit like another cohort around the 21, uh, 23 children, uh, neurotypical children, and then 21 children with autism, investigate gum microbiome again, surprisingly, and then happily, uh, we confirmed these two results from this court as well. Diversity with much more higher in the uh, neurotypical children, as you see in the uh, left side of the graph, and also Prevotella, the abundance is more higher in the neurotypical children. Thinking about uh, the very the, uh, heterogeneity condition of a human gut microbiome, it is uh, important that uh, this observation was reproduced by the two different cohort. Then at the time, the next question was how we can increase the diversity of a uh, gut microbe in children with autism. Is there any way that we can incre increase the relative abundance prevotella? There was the occasion that we have after war. And then can we even improve the symptoms of autism by modulating gum microbiota? There was the question that we have. So we think about what could be the best way to modulate or change the gum microbiota. First thing that we can think about antibiotics and that kind of kill off the pathogenic bacteria or prebiotics, which is like the vegetables and foods that can like the increase the growth of the beneficial micro microbes or probiotics like the bifidobacterium or lactobacillus in yogurt. You may uh, uh, have a loss of the probiotics and then may modulate uh, your gum microbiota in a beneficial way. There are some few studies uh, at the time. Uh, here, 
For example, vancomycin, which is one of antibiotics, has been later studied and then showing improved autism symptoms, but it was a temporal, temporary. And probiotics uh, did not treat autism symptoms that much. And in animal studies, when uh, the Bacchioides fragilis uh, was uh, in, introduced in mice, in the animals, that kind of they improved the behaviors in the, uh, the mouse that has the uh, autistic symptoms. Although these like the probiotics uh, somehow shows an uh, improvement, but it was in the temporary for the, uh, or did not show the improvement in, for humans. So we thought about like the more wild idea, which is the fecal microbiota transplant, which is kind of poop samples basically. But the idea was that maybe the probiotics like the uh, certain single microbes like the Bifidobacterium lactobacillus may not work that much because the usually you know, in our gut, we have uh, thousands of different microbes. So one or two or a couple of the different microbial types may not affect them much uh, in microbiota. So we use fecals, fecal microbial transplant. This has been like a use as a medication in China in the old time. But in also in nowadays, like the, this is a very like the, uh, effective way to treat the, uh, the recurrence Clostridium diffusa infections. Uh, this is the only like the uh, uh, medication that are available for the patients who has a C diff infections. So I think that uh, we thought at the time it is not a wild idea to treat for children with autism. So there are a couple of questions that we have. First one is: Is fecal microbiota transplant safe for children with autism? We retreat gastrointestinal problems like the uh, constipation and diarrhea. And how about severity of autism symptoms? If uh, this fecal microbial transplant really help to improve the autistic, autism symptoms, that was the question that we have. So we recruit uh, 20 neurotypical children and then 18 children with autism to try this like, trial. Uh, we recruited ages from the seven to 17 years old. Uh, because of the safety issue, we couldn't try the uh, children who has the lower than seven years old. And then we focused on the children who has a moderate or severe GI problems. We tried a different, uh, two different way of fecal transplant, oral or rectal initial treatment, and then oral dosis. So basically, although this is the fecal transplant, but we designed the, uh, the therapy, which is called microbiota transfer therapy, which is the combining uh, antibiotics and the fecal microbiota transplant together. Although the, I kind of, we, I talk about the fecal matters, which is the stool or poop samples, but we very purified these fecal matters. So that ends up the purified fecal matters up to 99% bacteria from healthy donors, which is called standardized human gut microbiota. So idea was like to try the first antibiotic and then the fecal uh, transplant. This is like a 10 week treatment and then eight week the observation period. So as like the here, first we try the antibiotics for like the two weeks. So that way we kind of wash out all the pathogenic bacteria, all the bad bacteria that may uh, already exist in the children with autism. And then the, we try the initial year, like the, the, uh, uh, the fecal transplant by using the very high concentrate of the fecal samples, fecal matters. And then following the seven or eight weeks, we provided a daily maintenance dose like the, for fecal matters. So the children basically, they kind of mix the purified the fecal materials in the orange juice, and then they drink it every day. This is a very rigorous uh, treatment because the uh, Clostridium diffusa infection treatment, for example, they just only tried the one day fecal transplant but we thought at the time one day is not enough. So we tried every day for seven or eight weeks treatment we applied. 
So surprisingly, and, um, uh, and the very interestingly, we found that GI symptoms improved. As you see on the y-axis, GSRS is a score. It's a high score means the more severe GI problems. But that scores are coming down after 18 weeks, which is like the uh, showing that the children with uh, autism kind of relieved from the GI symptoms. Even we found that autism behavior symptoms improved. We tried the different like the scares uh, assessment, which is the childhood autism rating scares, CARS and SRS, ABC. All three like the, uh, these assessments shows that it's kind of improvement on the, uh, the autistic symptoms as you see on the graph on the right side, all scores is coming down after uh, week uh, 10 weeks, which is the end of treatment and the week 18, which is eight weeks after treatment stopped. So we are so excited. And then the next question was like, the, how about the microbiome? As I was hypothesized, maybe uh, we, uh, as we hypothesize, we kind of try, we uh, expect that microbiome diversity increased. And then in fact, when we look into microbiome, uh, microbial diversity increased significantly after microbiome transfer therapy, as you saw here. And also we found that the three beneficial bacteria increased, for example, including Prevotella. So Prevotella was reduced at the very beginning uh, before they treat uh, with the, uh, the fecal transplant, but Prevotella increased a lot. And then bifidobacterium, which is well known, the, uh, the benefits of bacteria also signif significantly increased after treatment. But this is the phase one open label trial, uh, which means the uh, kids knows that and families knows that uh, we are, uh, they are having the fecal, fecal materials. It is not blinded. So the there is some kind of a drawback that because the kids and families knows that they have a treatment, they may expect that they could see some kind of improvement. So this is kind of the uh, placebo effect maybe involved. But although at the time we didn't have the, uh, uh, the another cord that doesn't have a plus the controller placebo effect, but we follow up like the two years like the follow up study. So once we come back to like the children and then we revisit 16 children with autism, they provided uh, like the fecal materials and also they are happily like the uh, volunteer to assess uh, their improvement or not after two years. So 16 out of 18 children uh, was like the, uh, the participate this like the, uh, the, the uh, analysis again, which is surprising because it's a very good portion. Maybe they have a, still have a good improvement. So we kind of the, on this, try to analyze the, their microbiome and then their behavior symptoms and published on this paper. So GI symptoms uh, still improved comparing to the baseline. Although it's a, uh, after two years, the scores a little bit bounce back but still comparing to two years ago, it's still the GI symptoms were improved. And then more surprisingly, behavior symptoms uh, was like they improved even more than the uh, eight weeks after treatment stop. As you see here on the graph and CARS and SARS, SRS, that shows that the scores are coming down and down. So after two years, so some of us, uh, the kids even have a scores even less than the criteria for minimal or no symptoms. So as you see on the red line, this is a criteria that kind of defines the either minimal or severe severity. But the uh, couple of uh, children was even like the minimal or no symptoms of behaviors. So as you see in the down in the bar graph, at the very beginning, the red color severe symptoms, almost 80 or 90% of children has a severe symptoms in the beginning. But after two years, like the 50, like the percent is now even minimal or no symptoms of the behaviors, which is very surprising uh, because even after two years, between that, we didn't try any like a fecal transplant, but two years after still, they have uh, those, uh, the very minimal uh, the behavior symptoms. 
And then we will also take a look at the microbiome there. And then the, we try the DNA-based microbiome analysis and also metabolite-based approach together. So first the microbiome, same way we try this uh, 16 s rivals RNA gene with the Illumina platform. Found that diversity is a still increased after two years. And then this is another interesting part in Grafman analysis, which is shows that um, the distance from the uh, gum microbiome to the donor samples, for example, like the, at the very beginning in the baseline, uh, their gum microbiome is uh, different from the donors. Um, but as like time goes on in the treatment week three, week 10, week 18, they like the, their microbiome is uh, similar to the donors, but after two years, it is different from donors like the gum microbiome, which is interesting because even though their microbiome is different from their donors the microbiome, and stabilized at the other stage of a gum microbiome, but still they have a very diverse microbiome and also their behaviors is a still like the improve, is their improvement on uh, behavior is still maintained. And then the, we also take a look like the, the three different uh, beneficial microbes is still maintained very high, which is like the consistent from the, uh, the uh, 18 week observation. And also we look into the metabolomic uh, profiles like the, by using SCMS analysis, we obtain the metabolites from feces and plasma blood around the 600 or 700 metabolites. We, uh, and then it, we investigate it. But first the plasma metabolites, as you see here, there are many met metabolites either is uh, very higher at baseline or lower base at the baseline comparing to the uh, control, but that kind of uh, levels are either uh, reduced after uh, plan, uh, the treatment or increased after treatment. And the overall, like the, as you see here, their profiles are changed. For example, in this like the 3D graph uh, at the baseline, your typical is a green, like the circle color, uh, and then the red circle color baseline autism is a very different the for uh, plasma uh, metabolites. But after this treatment, this metabol uh, metabolite profiles in plasma is very close to the neurotypical. Uh, fecal metabolites, we also found some changes although it is not significantly changed as uh, we saw in the plasma metabolite profiles. But we found a very interesting metabolite, which is one of them is a uh, paracresol sulfate. That was known as uh, some kind of toxicants. And then we previously is a very higher in feces in the children with autism. But we found that this levels of picresol sulfate is very high in autism and baseline but after treatment is reduced and then it's similar to the levels of your typical uh, children. This picresol or paracresol sulfate uh, is very uh, similar to 4-ethyl phenyl sulfate in the chemical structure wise. And then this 4-ethyl phenyl sulfate levels uh, was very reduced when the, in the animal study, they treat the uh, autism symptoms in the mice. So those uh, picresol sulfate could be the one like the uh, chemicals or the metabolites that we have to focus on. And then we also try to relate in the gum microbiome. And we found that this uh, picresol sulfate is a negative correlate with the uh, disulfovirio. Um, and then disulfovirio is known to the reduce sulfate. So, the role of a disulfovirio that we found there is uh, increased a lot in the after treatment, maybe have a role to reduce the picrosa sulfate. And then this uh, reduce uh, in the picrosa sulfate could be one of the contributing, contributing factor for the improvement on the autistic uh, behaviors. So last question is, may the, is that possible that fecal metabolites could be a biomarkers? 
So we collaborate with uh, Dr. Uh, Jorgen Han in the RPI, and then he kind of the, do the uh, machine learning, the multivariate analysis, and then see if there's any like the fecal metabolites could be a, uh, as a biomarker. Although the one or single metabolite was not much significantly different, but when we look into like the group of the fecal metabolites, for example, here, uh, the five metabolites, um, either the, there's or the adenosine or indoor is a different, but the other four, the metabolites is a little same. So when we look into those five metabolites and then look into that, and then we found that their initial that the metabolite uh, concentration is way different between the uh, neurotypical, which is TD and the ASD. And then after treatment, we found that like the, that kind of difference between those uh, five like the metabolites uh, is very similar to the typical the neurotypical samples. As you see in the graph and the down that the blue line is the uh, typical metabolites and then red is like the in the baseline before they treat the, uh, the autism uh, with the fecal transplant. But when the fecal transplant is, was applied, that uh, those five the metabolites are very similar to the neurotypical group, which is the green colors. As you see on the right, uh, there was also same for the another group of five. So although maybe one or two of the single fecal metabolites is not strong enough to separate the two different groups, but groups of fecal metabolites could be the good like the biomarkers, potential biomarkers for the understanding the, uh, the autism in early ages of children with autism. In summary, uh, on our studies, we found that microbiota transfer therapy, they're kind of combining the antibiotics and the fecal transplant successfully modify the gut environment and then uh, got in microbiota to be beneficial on autism and gut symptoms in children with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, even two years after treatment, we found that most improvement in the GI symptoms were maintained and even the behavior symptoms improved more significantly. In the microbiome side, we found that the diversity is still very increased, uh, significantly increased after trans transplant. And even two years after the treatment stopped, we found the diversity increase, which is kind of the, uh, the uh, satisfying our hypothesis. And also we found that bifidobacteria and prevotella with beneficial microbe is increased a lot and then maintained uh, at high level. And then lastly, the from the multivariate analysis, uh, we can maybe uh, we could say fecal micro uh, metabolites could be a potential biomarker as a group. With that, thank you very much for your attention. And then uh, I welcome to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kang, for your very wonderful talk. Now we Thank have time for a um, few questions.
Now it's time for the meet and greet session. Participate in this activity. We have a general room Zoom where a colleague will be directing the participants to the respective room. There will be two general rooms. The first room is related to cancer, heart, and related diseases. The responsibles for this session are our colleagues, Aaron Vasquez and Brenda Loaiza. For the second room, we have the topic of good microbiota, COVID-19, and related diseases. This second room, the responsibles are me, Diego, and Estrella Martinez. Thank you so much.